first time back since 2008. So uh, very happy to be here this year as, as a speaker. Holds a, a dear place in my heart because that kind of launched my own uh, speaking career. Uh, after having met them, I, I copied, stole with pride some parts of Uncle Bob's keynote here and did it in Sweden, which ended me up on the first page of the, the local uh, Computer Sweden newspaper. So, so that was pretty nice. All right. Um, Enough about me, uh, other than that I'm now a consultant at CRISP and that I worked six and a half years at, at Spotify and, and also happened to write a book about Kanban in action. But I'm here to talk about Discover Weekly, as we heard, or rather using that as a showcase for the agile culture or culture around autonomy and empowerment uh, that we worked very hard to, to create and then preserve at Spotify as we grew from eight teams in the beginning when I was there to more than 200 teams. And now, the last time I actually met someone at Spotify who is in the know uh, six months ago, they said, we actually don't know how many teams we have. We've tried to figure it out, but we can't. And it's not that important to us, but four or 500 maybe. Uh, so anyone here who does not know what Spotify is, raise your hand if you don't know what Spotify is. Wow, cool. Uh, maybe it's a selection bias that you attend this, this talk then. Uh, how many of you do not know what Discover Weekly is? Okay, some hands. Okay, nice. So let me give you a, a quick overview of Discover Weekly. Uh, that will set us up for the story as well. So this is probably most people are familiar with the playlist concept. Uh, you know, you create playlists uh, like the old mixtapes of, of my youth. You add some songs, so I, I created my summer rotation. You can see by Joakim Sundén. Uh, or I can choose to follow a, a playlist that someone else has created. Uh, funk Out of Here by Spotify. It's a pretty cool funk compilation if, you, if you're into that. But then, all of a sudden, a new thing happened for many people. We have Discover Weekly. It's not something I've made. It's not something I've chosen to follow, but it's made for me. What's that? And when I click on it, it's 30 songs that I've never listened to before, on Spotify at least. Spotify still doesn't know uh, if I listen to them elsewhere, but maybe they will, maybe they will. And uh, uh, it's a high chance that I will actually like these songs. So that's what we're going to talk about, how this came to be. But before that, do you remember how you used to find music before Spotify? Maybe something like this. You know, we go to uh, uh, your favorite record store. This one is, is uh, ginormous uh, in, in Los Angeles, uh, the Amoeba record store. And uh, I have friends, music nerds, ex-colleagues at Spotify who could spend hours and hours and hours. Uh, this, this would be their idea of heaven. Uh, I could see myself spending a, a lot of time as well, but, but you know, there's a, there's a limit. My mom, on the other hand, uh, you know, she's, she loves music, but she knows what she likes. Uh, she doesn't like to, to go browse in new records. She has a pretty, you know, set taste. So she would rather go across the store and, and, and browse for some clothes and so on while, while I would be going into the record store. And then Spotify came along and, and did this. Pretty much replaced uh, this browsing experience with, with a search and play concept or paradigm. So you could put anything in here and find it within seconds. Uh, I was brought up with, uh, or had used in my time in university, Kazaa, Napster, may maybe some of you know them, the piracy apps, where you would at a party say, oh, do you have Napster installed? Let's, let's see if I can find this music. And if you were lucky, there were some people connected who had the song that you were looking for. You had to download it, uh, find out if it really was that song or if someone was trying to trick you by changing the name. And, and now the same thing, all the songs were available. So you were just, oh, I wonder if they have this and that and this. And they have most of my more obscure taste in music they, was available to play like that. I was amazed. But then, again, using my poor mom as, as an example, I would show her this search field. And she was just, what do I type in? Well, duh, what, what do you like to listen to? Um, the Beatles? Damn, they're not on the service. Unfortunately, there are some rights issues. Uh, Rolling Stones, okay, yeah, we can play that. 
I think she was pretty amazed, but uh, still what was exciting to me was more intimidating to her. She didn't really know what to type. She didn't want to sit there and, and you know, search for different types of music. She's used to just tune into a radio station and, and listen to it. If it's not good, tune into another one. So back at the headquarters, our CEO and, and one of the founders, Dan, uh, Daniel Ek, would say, hey, we've nailed search and play. Congratulations. But if you don't know what you want to listen to, our product is pretty much useless. So we had done the typical startup thing, which is FUBU, for us, by us. We built something for ourselves that we really liked. And apparently millions and millions of other users did as well. But to really go mainstream, to get all these billions of users that were still not on Spotify, we need a different strategy. We started calling this customer segment or user segment lean back mainstream users. While we who are using the product ourselves, we were more lean forward users. We like to search and play and curate playlists and, and, and search and browse music. So we tried with, with some different things. Uh, radio, the obvious one. You put in a genre and, and, and maybe a decade so you can find 70s jazz. Uh, didn't really get a, a, a huge impact with, with, with this user segment. So we tried, oh, maybe you can use a song to, to seed uh, a, a radio, like our competitor Pandora, they, they were huge on, on this field, in this field. Or you could use an entire playlist and, and seed a radio station. But that was kind of too complicated for, for most of the people who, who were in the mainstream lean back users. Uh, personally, I think that people who like radio, well, they listen to radio. They wouldn't you know, start up Spotify to do that. So we tried this thing, Discover. It's a Pinterest style, uh, never ending scroll, Netflix style uh, recommendations. Uh, oh, you listened to Of Mice and Men recently. Want to try Motionless in White? And the music nerds at Spotify love this. Oh, there's a connection between Of Mice and Men and Motionless in White. Oh, oh I, interesting. I, I, I want to check this out. You could browse and browse and browse forever. My mom, she wouldn't start her Sunday by, oh, now I'm going to browse Discover and see what, what new cool music I can, can check out and listen to. So it didn't really fly. So at this point, people at Spotify were suggesting, and actually at the, in, in the industry at large, there were, were people in, on music sites and music blogs suggesting that you know, Spotify wasn't the only company work, uh, working with recommendations and, and discovery. So there were some, some suggestions by, by serious people saying that mainstream lean back users, they don't want to discover new music. They're happy with how things are. There's actually no real case here to, to do this. But a, a couple of engineers at Spotify, they didn't agree. They came up with an idea. They said, we, we have a, there must be a way to, with less friction to reach these uh, mainstream lean back users. So they came up with an idea. They pitched it to, to the product manager, Matt Ogle, and he said, yeah, I, I, I like it, so, so let's be cautious when, when we like an idea. Uh, we know that most ideas won't pan out. So let's bring in the designer to, to play bad cup. And they did. So uh, why do we need this feature? It's so, it's so We're so bloated with features already. A mainstream lean back user don't want more features. They want simpler features. We have to remove things, take things away. And uh, you know, using the playlist like you, you, you want to do, it's a big design no-no. You can't put, you know, user or Spotify-generated stuff in an area that's user-generated content. People will become upset, it will be confusing, you can't do this. Okay, so they had to refine their idea and so on. So, basically, it's, it's, it's reconnecting the dots. It was repurposing technology that, that we already had. We had data on how 75 million people were listening to music on Spotify. We had a, a really appreciated, intuitive user interface in the playlist. We had algorithms that could put uh, songs into micro genres, so we could say this one is, is, is connected to that one, and, and if you like this song, you probably like that one too, and so on. So, is anyone here using Discovery Weekly? Okay. So maybe you, you have this playlist that you've created. It's got 20 songs, and you're like, wow, this, this is, I'm so unique, I'm such a snowflake. It's, I can't imagine that anyone else has this, these 20 songs. Uh, but of course, as you understand, we can find 
like thousands and thousands of users maybe that have the exact same 20 songs or maybe 18 of these 20 songs. And what if they have, or 80% of them have two or three songs in common that you've never listened to on Spotify? Hmm, there's a chance that you like these. So that's the basics of how Discover Weekly works. It's called collaborative filtering. So uh, the engineers, the designer, and the product manager said, let's, let's test this idea. Let's just take some time off the, the usual tasks and keeping the lights on and so on that we do in, in the Lambda squad, as the team was called, and, and try this new idea. And already, when I described this scenario to many organizations that I work with, uh, when, when I left Spotify in 2017, I became a consultant. I, I thought, well, well, most companies maybe have gone through maybe not the extreme journey that Spotify has, but you know, a lot has happened in the industry. So this is, you know, this is how people work these days, I assume, but no. It's like, not at all. No one. And it's like engineers thinking about the business problem. That's keeping them awake at night. How can we decrease friction? No, that, that doesn't happen. Just being able to pitch it to a product manager, the product manager just say, yeah, let's try it. No, it, it wasn't like that at all. So in, in most traditional organizations, I, I sometimes I call them bureaucratic or plan-driven organizations, it looks a little bit like this. So top management, uh, the f they feel we, we have to have some kind of control. Even if we want to empower people, even if we want to work in an agile way, you know, we need some control. It, okay, it can't be detailed, so, so let's focus on the big projects, on the long-term projects, and only that. But the problem is, to do that, we need detailed budgets on these projects. And we need to have different toll gates where we can track progress and so on. And to do that, we need to understand, okay, what will we actually be doing? Who needs to be involved? What roles? How, how should we man this? Or what, what resources, typically? And that means you have to lock down, you have to understand a lot of what are we building. And you have to lock down a lot of the decisions before you actually have information on, on what you need to do, before you can involve the people uh, actually developing the product. And then middle management, um, well, they're not responsible for the results. They now have a plan to carry out. They can only do resource allocation. You can check, are we on budget, are we on time, are we on scope? Often it's no, unfortunately. Uh, but that's pretty much the only thing they can control. And for efficiency reasons, we have created departments and, and organized ourselves in different departments, which quickly leads to silos. And if, if communication is hard enough within a department, it's even worse across departments. So collaboration becomes really hard. Meaning the middle management needs to do a lot of coordination and running around and, and, and introducing a lot of middlemen and misunderstandings and so on. And we don't really have any feedback loops because not until the project is done or delivered, then we have some information. But then we're typically so behind, we don't even have time to check, is this solution actually helping our problem? Well, the users said that this is what, this is what they wanted, and now we've kind of delivered that. So let's, let's just call it today, because we have so many new projects already late. We need to get them started. So Spotify took another approach. Uh, this is the CTO. He, he was uh, uh, on the demo scene for Commodore 64, so under the name Flamingo back in the day. He said, the most important feature of the organization is the autonomous squad. All other features are designed to support this mini startup-like uh, squad. So that's the picture he conveyed. This is what it should be, a mini startup. That was also a word that, that autonomous, autonomous squad, that didn't exist before I joined Spotify. When I came out at the end of Ed, everyone was talking about autonomy and autonomous teams. So I just assumed that, oh, they, they meant pretty much what we meant at Spotify. But then it dawned on me, no, autonomy has become synonymous with, uh, you know, we can deliver independently, we can release fairly independently. But what we always meant was what Marty Kagan and others have now dubbed empowered product team. So the most important thing is to empower teams by assigning them problems to solve and then give the teams the space to solve them. So the teams would be involved in coming up with the solutions, not just the implementation or the how, but actually what should we be doing? What sh how should we be solving this problem? So I, I've uh, you know, sided with Marty and, 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 and his company and, and now talk about Empowered Product Team, because uh, yeah, 
he even he even wrote a book with the title Empowered. So it seems like a uphill battle to to keep keep pushing autonomous squad. But it's it's pretty much the same. And, and Kagan has also said that and written that on his website. So this is the approach that we wanted to take. And one reason being that you know, most of the things that we tried at Spotify, they, they failed. All the great ideas, all the simple, uh, you know, obvious ideas, they failed. It was a very common scenario that developers would come to Spotify, we recruited them and say, oh, I have so many ideas and so now we can simplify the product. We should remove this and make this flow easier. And we were, you know what, we tried that. It's actually the opposite. What? No, it can't be. Let's try it again. And we did. But there are so many counterintuitive truths. And you can, oh, music streaming must be very, very special. No, it's not. It's like that in all product development. It's just that most people don't care. You know, you're able to make money anyway. Uh, so in order to be able to, to tackle these product risks early, you have to collaborate between all the responsibilities here. The product manager, product owner is typically, or the business maybe, commercial, they're the ones who care about, okay, is this viable for the business? Will we be able to make money on this? Will it serve our purpose and so on? Is it valuable? Can we get people to actually buy it and use it? Uh, is it usable? Do people understand it and, and, and do they want to use it? That's typically where UX or product design comes in. And is it feasible? And that's where engineering or development comes in. And this is not, you know, oh, we think it up, uh, you estimate it, uh, and, and then we do some, uh, where should this button go? No, that's not at all what it's about. These people need to work together continuously because all, most of the solutions are just hypotheses that will turn out to be wrong and then back to the drawing board. If you're only using engineers or developers to code, you're, you're not even getting half of the worth of it. They're working with the enabling technology every day. And, you know, it's uh, like Henry Ford quote, if I would have asked my customers, they would have said faster horses because they don't know what's possible. They're never going to ask for the latest technology and so on. So engineering needs to be involved. All right. So give them problems to solve. But it's essential that we define success by business results, also known as outcome, and not simply activity or output just to make sure that everyone's on the same page. So we see a lot of things happening in the world. We see pains for users and customers. We see needs that go unmet or unfulfilled. Uh, we see declining sales or, or whatever. This is the world as it is today. And this gives us ideas. Hmm, what if we make this product, make this feature, make this enhancement to our existing product? But too quickly, that's now what, what becomes our focus. Oh, we have a great solution, a great idea. Maybe it even turns to specifications and requirements. And now it's all about how can we fulfill this, how can we implement these things? And we start you know, working on the output. But what about this? Is it actually changing the world? Are people happier? Do they tweet more positive things about us? Is it, are their pains going away? That's what we should be focusing on. So the activities, the stories, the epics, the bets, features, whatever you call them, those are... Uh, how we believe we're going to reach our goals. But they are just hypotheses and bets. They have to change if the numbers aren't improving. And unfortunately, these bets have a re really low success rate. Uh, if you look at Ron Kohave, uh, author of the book Trustworthy Online Controlled Experiments, he used to run experimentation at, at Amazon and Microsoft. He says that the vast majority fail in experiments. Even experts often misjudge which one will, will pay off. At Google and Bing, only about 10 to 20% of experiments generate positive results. So if you're not better than Google and Bing, there's a risk that 80 to 90% of what you're doing just doesn't make any difference. Okay, if you're not only looking at, at end, end consumer things, but at Microsoft as a whole, wow, then we have one third effective. But what this also points out is that one third has neutral results and one third have negative results. So if you're not measuring the consequences of what you're doing, there's a big risk that you're actually, you know, you should have been, you would have been better off not doing it. And all the same, it, it just increases the complexity and, and, and complicatedness of, of your code and, and maintaining it and, and so on. So we need to move from opinions to data. 
we're working on X because Sam said it's important, or uh, we are done when Sam is okay with it, or when the specification is done. No. We're working on X because we think it's going to give impact Y, which matters to Spotify because of Z. And we're done when the metrics have moved. Or as Google would put it, you know, let data drive decisions, not the highest paid person's opinion, the hippo, the hippo prioritization. And a lot of people get that. So they're like, okay, we understand that, you know, this do what I say, we have complete alignment, you know, we carry, carry out my orders, it doesn't work. But they often fear that if the, the, the option is this, you know, do whatever, a, a bunch of people running around in, in, in different directions and, and nothing gets, gets done. But this is actually a false dichotomy. And this is not what autonomy means. At least not what we meant at Spotify. As my ex-colleague Jason, who used to be an agile coach in New York when I was in Boston, he points out that autonomy doesn't mean the freedom to do what you feel like. That's, that was never the case. Oh, I'm going to do whatever I want when I come to work. Today I'm going to write the search engine. And if someone said, no, you can't, you're on the radio team. Oh, I'm not autonomous. Uh, no, you, know, you wouldn't do that. It means you're feeling free to act with all your capabilities to contribute toward a collective outcome. That's what autonomy is. And there was a time when we realized that when we were growing a lot at Spotify, okay, how do we keep all these autonomous teams aligned? It used to be easy. We could just you know, talk about goals and strategy and we could easily find, find what, what our other teams doing and collaborating. But when we were dozens of teams, we started talking ex explicitly about aligned autonomy started emphasizing things like, what is the mission? How does that tie into product strategy, etc.? So we increased the clarity for the teams. We also organized ourselves into tribes around missions so that everything you need to focus on should be easily made available in this tribe, in this squad. And the rest, you can you know, block that out to decrease the cognitive uh, overload. So, we used alignment in this way to enable autonomy, uh, inspired by Stephen Bungay, Art of Action, military historian and business consultant. So if you have no, no alignment, no autonomy, you get an indifferent culture, no one can do anything without getting told what to do, because you don't have any mandate. Uh, you have to micromanage people to get anything done, because there is no clear goal to follow and, and, and no authority. So many organizations, uh, big organizations at least, are up in this corner. You can get things done, uh, you know, develop radio feature. Okay, it, it gets done, we, we understand what to do, we, we all walk in the same direction. But what you want, you always, you always want to be in the top right corner, right? So having high alignment, we need to reach mainstream lean back users. That's what we're all after. And if you have a collaborative culture, and you can collaborate together and understand what do we need to do to fulfill this? What can we test? What can we try? You get an innovative organization where we can figure out how and we can really use the knowledge on the floor, so to speak. And Spotify's problem was for a long time not to slip into this corner where you for sure have an entrepreneurial organization but a very chaotic culture and you don't really know who's working on what. You step on each other's toes, uh, you know, reinventing the wheel symbolized by, you know, hope someone is working on the mainstream lean back user problem, but, you know, who knows. So, remember this, okay, of course, you know, what happens to a pyramid, uh, you know, we, have, we need to flip it, and this is what we mean by aligned autonomy. How do we create this alignment? Well, the team, small and long-lived, self-organizing around clear missions, we work with recommendations, we work with continuous integration tooling, we work with uh, gathering metadata, the mission is clear. Okay, how do I use this mission to contribute to our overall strategy? Through goal-driven uh, uh, feedback loops. And we collaborate and understand what do we need to do, what are you doing, how does that fit in what, what, to what we are doing? And management focuses on vision and goals, supplying teams with the strategic context that they need to make good decisions. They act as servant leader and, and, and remove obstacles for the squads. But it's a lot about communication and, and creating this clarity. 
not just through communication, by the way, but also how we change organizational structures, the tooling we supply, the way of working that we do to increase the clarity in the organization and get transparent information, information flowing both ways. So that what we discover in the teams is actually informing the strategy. And strategy is set continuously throughout the year, not in annual plans. It's updated based on what we learn. And this means that product owner or product manager roles and many other roles needs to change to be a more facilitating role than a gatekeeping role. So in a gatekeeping context, uh, we have you know, product owners or business people or commercial, whatever you call it in your organization, they have access to the product context, the market and so on. Maybe you have a designer who has access to customers and users and the user research, but they gatekeep in traditional organizations, they gatekeep that information, they translate it into backlog items or work. This is what we've chosen to do. Maybe they have motivation, but you never get access to this context typically, which creates low empathy and low engagement with the team. Instead, how can we make this more easily digestible? How can we make it accessible for the teams? How can we engage the teams in wanting to understand this context so that they can be part of making decisions of, okay, what do we do based on this information? And just to give you an example, this is not from Discover Weekly, but a similar team that's called Taste Onboarding. So uh, everyone in the team would have access to detailed metrics on everything on, on, on that's uh, you know, relevant for, for Discover Weekly or Taste Onboarding. But they wouldn't have the time necessarily as engineers to, to plow through all of it. They might not have the, uh, the skills to make sense of it, but the product manager might. And they can work with product analysts and, and you know, summarize these are the most important findings. Oh, we see a decrease here due to added friction, blah, blah, blah. Uh, eight percentage points of regs drops out. To improve, we should optimize friction versus taste signals, get people to play without hurting recommendations. But still, this is context, this is data and information. It's not, nothing about, so we should build this feature. No, this is where we invite the team. And the product manager often has ideas, but it's better if the team has them first. And if they take ownership and come up with even better ideas, all the greater. Similar from user, inter, uh, user research and, and customer research, make it more easily accessible to the team. Okay, back to the Discover Weekly. We had a clear product strategy. We need to engage lean back users. This team was all about using recommendations. They had clear metrics for this uh, user segment, the reach, how many can we reach, depth, how much can we get them to engage more without cannibalizing other features, ideally, uh, and how can you get them to come back as much as possible. Really clear metrics that they could, could, could test. And then it's easy to have a new idea. You can immediately say, okay, do we think this new idea will help us reach this goal? And do we think it will push these metrics? Yeah, there's a chance, it might be. Great, let's put that to the test as quickly, as easily as possible. So they iterated a, a few weeks, came up with a prototype, and uh, tested it with the rest of the team, continuously improving it. Awesome, cool, thanks, wow. Just one thing though, experimenting and experimenting. So what should the cover art look like? So they started with a, a same picture for everyone, an, an astronaut, uh, astronaut on, on the moon, discover, you know. But hmm, maybe if we put me, but with cool colors, personalization, it's the oldest trick in the book. If you have, we could actually, uh, you know, we had a Facebook integration, so we could take your profile picture and overlay it and say, wow, this is created for me. It's me, I wanna click on this. Uh, but it was computationally very, oh, you can see here, by the way, the, the original. Computationally very expensive to do this with 75 million users. So architects and others would say, no, we, we can't do that. Uh, we can't justify that cost. Okay, let's run a test. And it was a 10% lift in weekly average usage, which is huge in, in these terms. And then it was a done deal. Of course we should do it. it. It motivates the cost. What's the right length? Should we have two hours, three hours, four hours? And all the music nerds driving the product were like, four hours, five. Uh, but user testing turned out, no, that's too much. And uh, for a very long time, we were a, a, a 
a quantitative shop at Spotify, mostly doing A-B testing and looking at the data and, and not bothering talking to users because they don't know what they want anyway. They're just saying things, you know, ignoring them, a pretty arrogant approach. Uh, but the better we became at, at actually combining these two, and we, we were actually one, one of the one early company to, to combine user research and product analytics into what's called product insights, and they started collaborating. So we could see, hmm, four hours isn't working, but we don't know why. But combining it with user uh, interviews, we could get some clues into how, what people were thinking. And it turns out if it's 30 songs, that we say, you're going to like these, new songs that you haven't listened to. Yeah, that seems reasonable. If they say, oh, here's 120 songs every week that you will like. It's like, mm, I don't know if I even like that many songs in my life. It just wasn't believable that, that we would come, come up with the right recommendations. How often should it be updated? And, and again, the music nerd is like, daily, hourly. Uh, no, every week seems to be the sweet spot we found through testing. What if we get the recommendations wrong? Should we err on the side of you know, making too familiar or too unfamiliar? We said too unfamiliar probably, because otherwise we will get, oh, you listen to Beatles when I'm 64, so let's put uh, A Day in Life from the same album. Ah, you probably listen to that, just not on Spotify. So yeah, we took it a little bit to the other side. And then we introduced a bug, so that two songs or two artists, I don't remember exactly, that you had listened to fairly recently uh, came onto the list. But uh, before considering it a bug, we looked at the numbers. How did it perform? And it turned out it f performed better. And through user research, again, we found out that, hmm, oh, look, I know these two. Spotify gets me. Maybe the other 28 songs are right. And then there was a lot of, of strange content. Uh, and uh, still to this day, years and years after the launch, Swedish people still complain that they get Danish music, for instance. or. And Danish people probably complain the Swedish music. I don't know. I think it's a guilty pleasure that, that people just don't want to confess to. Spotify knows you better than you know yourself, right? So we had a winning formula. Two hours of personalized music recommendations. Refreshed every Monday morning. Delivered in a standard Spotify playlist, so we didn't know, need any new UX. Playlist images based on the user's Facebook account and all songs replaced each week. Because we found, again, through testing that, uh, oh no, I have to listen to it before it's gone. If it would have been daily, you know, people wouldn't have been bothered, but weekly they can check in. Then, then it's, it's got this pull to, I should check in weekly or I'll miss what, what was uh, recommended for me. So it was 100% data informed, no front end development needed. And uh, if you remember, there was this contention with the designers saying that you can't do this uh, because this was, uh, I don't know if you remember these things, but Apple Music had recently done uh, a deal with U2 and put U2's new album in the library for all users. And it was a huge backlash and people were you know, upset like crazy. We could never have imagined that that would happen, but they were so upset. So it was highly controversial to do this. So now what? Let's, uh, let's do an employee release. So the team actually started just sneaking it out, not saying anything. So people discovered, what? what's this? And, and it started to go like a little bit viral uh, at Spotify. So people started listening and using it, even though they didn't understand what it was. So that was a good early sign. But then we did a more proper employee test, uh, asked people to try it out. Uh, it was the first time when we came up with the idea to use in the playlist description, oh, let's put a link to a Google form and people can actually give us feedback. Uh, so please rate it. And people did, started using it and loved it. What's this? Wow, awesome, release it. It's as if my secret music twin put it together. Everything in it is good and awesome uh, survey results. Please ship it, great, awesome, I adore it. So now what? It seems like we have something good on our hands, but remember, it's not for us. We're building this product, so, so we need to you know, test it. The CTO has said that a team should be able to ship anything to 5% of users. No questions asked, no permission needed, just do it. And this is also something that stands out in this culture that was very consciously created and nurtured 
like the CEO, saying again and again in town halls and emails, we aim to make mistakes, mistakes faster than anyone else. Which might seem strange, taken out of context, but of course, in order to learn fast, learn faster than anyone else. It's okay to fail. We need to be failing, otherwise we're not innovating. So the CTO would write, celebrate failure. If uh, X percent of what you're doing isn't failing, you're not innovating enough. Uh, blog post on how we shot ourselves in the foot. I went to lunch and when I came back, the server was down. This is what I learned. And teams started putting up these fail walls about their mistakes and failures they've done and, and what they've learned from it. And we even recorded videos, the CEO, product managers, engineers, talking about their failures and mistakes and what they learned, showing them at town halls. But of course, the message here is not, uh, you know, be sloppy, don't care. No, it's also about changing work practices and technology so it is safe to fail rather than doing things fail safe. So for instance, having a decoupled architecture and using microservices. So if, uh, you know, album art blows up because you're experimenting with it, everything else still works. It's okay. Notification blows up. Okay, you're not getting spammed, so you're, you're only listening to music. That's fine. Or gr gradual rollouts. So if something happens, we can quickly roll back. All right, so great. Let's do it. We're modest. Let's do 1%. It's still 750,000 people. Will they like it? We'll find out. And yeah, the data was great. Uh, we had we kept this, this link to a Google form actually, uh, 1,200 survey responses we got, and uh, two of them were complaining or mentioning this due to debacle. What's this? Why are you putting this in my playlist? But they still rated the service high. So it showed that the, the concerns from the designer were unfounded. Okay, they're paid to have these concerns, so, so it's, it's okay anyway. And uh, watching the buzz on Twitter, we knew we had a hit on our hands. It's scary how well Spotify Discover Weekly playlists know me, like former lover who lived through a near-death experience with me well. At this point, Spotify Discover Weekly knows me so well that if it proposed, I'd say yes. Or Discover Weekly on Spotify eliminates the need for a musically knowledgeable boyfriend. Now I can be single forever. Economical win. Um, so, we had a winner. Awesome. Great. But, it's always a but, isn't it? It didn't scale. So when we roll it out, it grinded to a halt. And of course, the architects, the senior engineers, they had been saying this, you can't do this. You shouldn't do this. The playlist system is not built to do this. We've talked about it for years that we should rebuild it, but we're not there yet. So hold off, please wait. No, we can't wait. They did it anyway. But now we had to undeploy and Twitter was upset. But just like that, my Spotify Discover Weekly playlist was taken from me. I'm in mourning. I hope it returns soon. But now we knew we had a winner on our hands. So now we could easily motivate months of work, several teams involved that had been, you know, we've been thinking of it for years, but never done it. Now we knew. Let's do it. But it took some time. I think this is the, the thing here. In any other company that I worked with, you know, Discover Weekly would have never seen the light of day because you would have needed permission from designers, from business people, from uh, architects and engineers, and it would have been no on, on all accounts. No, 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 you shouldn't do this. But it's not the hippo, it's the data. And the data was proving them right all the time. They could do this by cheap and, and safe experiments. So we gradually rolled it out again, tweaked the marketing message. Now when we knew that there was a hit, marketing got involved and so on. And that meant, oh yeah, we should have the user's own language in the launch. And, and this was before we had extended A-B testing practices and this way of thinking to marketing. So they just did this. In the end, through A-B testing, we learned that this was bad and we translated it back or we did it, put it back to Discover Weekly. Uh, user research told us that it's, it felt more like a brand on its own when it was Discover Weekly. It kind of got lost in, in people's playlists and, and so on when it was translated to their own language. We used uh, the Twitter uh, buzz in, in the marketing, tweaked the pack packaging a little bit, and it was a huge hit. You know, one billion tracks streamed in 10 weeks, which is huge. 
at Twitter. Monday mornings I take a bath and listen to Discover Weekly. Got really excited and started crying a little because I realized tomorrow is Monday and Spotify is making me a new Discover Weekly. It's actually sad, so sad how excited I get for a new Discover Weekly on Spotify every Monday. So I, I, don't, I, I quickly flipped through the title slide of this talk, but it had an a alternative title, with, which was how we accidentally fixed Mondays, because now people are looking forward to Mondays in, instead of, uh, of dreading it. And this one is a little bit fun. Okay, everyone is right. Discover Weekly is absolutely perfect. And this guy is the co-creator of Pandora, our biggest competitor in the US at the time. So it was uh, quite an acknowledgement. So we believe that uh, the ingredients of successful innovation is that you put people and problems, clearly defined, into a fail-friendly environment with cross-functional teams where it's okay to throw things away and fail as long as you learn. And uh, you do that by having enough slack to actually think about different ideas and try them, and clear success metrics, a feedback infrastructure, and user testing and feedback loops, and awesome new stuff will come out at the end. And to the point that I was making that uh, most other companies that I work with, or, or all, this would never have seen the day of, uh, light of day. Um, I, I told this story in a course that I've done uh, a couple of times, and, and then uh, after that, Daniel appeared in, in one of his rare interviews uh, with Fast Company and, and proved me even more right. You've had some pretty successful consumer rollouts, like the Discover Weekly personalized playlist. I would have killed that if it was me, just 100%. Why would you have killed it? I never really saw the beauty of it. I questioned them two or three times. Are you sure you really want to do this? Why are we spending all this time and energy? For a while, we didn't give that team any more funding in terms of headcount, but they kept working on it anyway. All of a sudden, they shipped it. I remember reading about it in the press. I thought, oh, this is going to be a disaster. And then, obviously, it turned out to be something really successful. It's one of the most loved product features that we have. There are lots of things in this company that I didn't think were good ideas that turned into some of the best things, and then it goes on to list all of those things. And I think this really shows the, the, the culture of, of autonomy and empowered product teams, even though the CEO thought it was a bad idea and didn't want to give them more funding. You know, the biggest hippo in the company. No, it doesn't matter. We can prove him wrong. So, to close, innovation can't be forced, just enabled, encouraged, and supported. Managers can't make it happen, but they can create an environment to support it and stop it from being killed. But that was all for me. Feel free, feel free to contact me. Uh, you have my email address and, and other uh, information. And don't forget to vote in the GoToGuideApp. Thank you.